Bien. Bon, je, je bascule tout de suite en anglais. Good morning. Welcome to the second edition of this uh, workshop on uh, scientific writing in English. So this is organized by, uh, well, the presenters are Nick Hall, who is somewhere in the back from Lagos. Say hi, Nick. And my name is Jeroen Sonke. I am at uh, JET. So Nick's from Lagos. I'm at JET. Uh, the, the real organizers are Etienne Gondet, who you've just met, and Williams X. Vraya the, of the library here at the observatory, also in the back, who has a selection of books on this particular topic, on, uh, on scientific writing in English. Uh, a little bit later, for the sort of the writing uh, practical work, we will have four assistants, Audrey, Hannah, Jared, and Erwin, whom you will meet. So the idea is that we do uh, about two times 45 minutes of, uh, of uh, sort of a course. I will start with a short guide to scientific writing, and then Nick will focus on typical, uh, typical mistakes you can make in, in English writing. There's a um, There'll be a coffee break just after, and then the rest of the day we will focus on abstract writing. So I think you all brought an abstract in more or less deplorable state, maybe, maybe in a very good state, we'll see. And uh, we will try to correct live on the screen a few of these abstracts with you uh, at the end of the morning and also during the afternoon. Uh, so let's, let's start with uh, the part that I am presenting. A simple short guide to scientific writing. And I'll start with uh, a slide that I printed out. I only printed two of my slides. Those are the essential ones. These are not rules for writing. They're, I don't pretend to have rules. I can only make suggestions. Um, different teachers will give you different suggestions. So it's up to you to, to work with this. And uh, let, let's get into it. There's a not even a dozen of them. Let's start with uh, the first one. Always try to write for a general science audience. Not for your grandmother, but for a general science audience. So that, that means fellow students or non-specialists, uh, people that who, do, who do not work particularly on your topic and know exactly all the right words in your, in your field. Uh, this makes your, your writing much more interesting to a much larger audience. And I think we should all think of uh, science writing as, as storytelling. I mean, we've all read papers where we don't, we just don't understand what the, what the team, the writing team, is talking about, basically because it's not very well written. Things are not well connected. There is not a lot of logic in, in what some people write. So think of it as storytelling. It has to be interested. Put yourself in the place of the reader, because we are all readers in the end. Um, so writing for a general audience requires often that you use simple words and keep your phrases short, as short as possible. Only one or two lines, not more. Uh, this is something that's more difficult to do when you write in French. You often end up with three, four, or five lines. Uh, in English, what works best is keep it short. Keep subject and verb together and use as few verbs as possible. I will give examples of this a little bit later. But really, keep things simple. Then another thing I like to, I'd like to do is to, to connect each phrase to the next one. Don't change topic between phrases. That's when people lose track of what you are trying to tell. So to do that, uh, well, you can connect phrases. You can also connect paragraphs. And sometimes you can, the easy way to do this is by using closing and opening phrases that reflect links between the different paragraphs. Um, to connect phrases and paragraphs, I think it is convenient to repeat words from one phrase to the next. That makes it very clear for the reader how the logic flows and what you are talking about. Um, if you take a writing course in literature, the teachers will tell you that this is the one thing that is forbidden, right? You should not repeat words. Well, I personally think that in science writing, it actually makes our text much more clear if you start repeating words. So you can, you know, like I said, play with this. See for yourself uh, if, uh, if you think it is good to repeat words in, in your text. I think it is. 
Um, then something that we will pay attention to today, it's a very simple rule, avoid the use of pronouns. Examples of pronouns is these vague little words, it, they, these, their, or those. It refers to something you have written in a previous phrase. The thing is that most of the time it's not really clear what you actually refer to, and that, that blurs the message of what you're, you're writing. So that's where it comes back. It's much better to repeat words than to use pronouns. So I will give examples later. Um, you have a word in mind, but it's not exactly the, the, the right word, the right term. Um, use a thesaurus online to find synonyms. It's not only practical, you also rapidly learn, uh, you just learn a lot of vocabulary in English, and it improves your writing in, uh, in the long term. Okay? So a pretty compact set of rules. We can give writing courses that last weeks and weeks. Uh, that's not the point today. The point is to, to, to keep this short, 2 times 45 minutes, just a simple set of rules that we would like you to use today to improve your own abstracts. Um, examples. So simple words and, and few verbs. This, this summer I was uh, correcting a paper in my field. And I pasted it here in the top. It, it goes in the past, in the past decade, dozens of studies have attempted to use mercury isotope tracers to investigate sources and processes of mercury from natural background and anthropogenic emission. Three lines, a mouthful. If we count the verbs, attempt to use, investigate, or three of them. So it's an example where the first thing I try to do in the second phrase is I bring it together to the essential verb. In the past decade, dozens of studies investigated mercury isotopes, etc. And then you can further condense this phrase by simply saying, previous studies investigated mercury isotopes as tracers for natural and anthropogenic sources, etc. Okay? So that's an example how you can easily simplify your phrases into something that's only two lines long. Um, even though most of it is focused today on, on abstract writing, I will start with a little overview of a typical science document and give a little bit of advice on, on these different sections. Of course, starting with, you know, you know this sequence, title, abstract, introduction, materials, results, discussion, conclusions, everybody knows this. It's a little bit more interesting to look, like, to look at it, uh, if you look on the left, by realizing that the title, that's the place where you, where you push your keywords. That's where you do your marketing. When people are looking for papers in Web of Science, it's your title and the keywords that, uh, that are behind the search engines. Okay? So your title should contain the right keywords. Uh, an abstract is simply the summary of what I did, what you found. Introduction, you describe what the, what the main problem is. Then how did you solve that problem? In result, what did you find? And the discussion is about what does it all mean? Okay. Conclusions, what are the implications of that work? So we will go through all of these sections with examples. So the title should contain keywords describing your work presented. So let's compare a few titles. Very short title, Air Sea Exchange of Gases. Okay, that's pretty clear. But if you're looking for a specific topic in, in Web of Science, is that a paper you're going to click on? Are you going to read that abstract? Are you, are you going to download it? Really, you're looking for a little bit more information, right? So how about this title? The role of marine biology in air-sea exchange of CO2. So now we've added keywords, and there's a lot more information in this title already. Um, probably, if you know what you're looking for, uh, greenhouse gases, CO2, or marine biology, at this point, you would click on it and see what's in the abstract. Then again, that particular title, it, it gives you a hint about what the paper is on, but it, it, it doesn't say anything about its major findings. So if, you, if your science, if your results have very clear findings, then you can explore integrating your results into the title. So that's the last example. Here at the bottom, where, we, for example, we can read, Reduced air sea CO2 exchange in the Atlantic Ocean due to biological surfactants. So now the, the main finding of this particular study has been included uh, into the title. 
So it's not just about exchange of CO2, but actually the authors found that there is reduced CO2 exchange due to not only biological activity, but surfactants, and we've also added the, uh, the place of study, Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so later on in your abstract, you can play with this as well. Try to improve your title to use as many keywords as possible and to make it as informative as possible. Um, next, the abstract. If you go on Google and you kind of type how to write a nature abstract, you will, your first hit will be this one. Uh, and it's a little bit, I can't work with this today because it's, it's too small, it's too hard to read. So, but we're going to use this, this, this example. It's also, it's a fairly, uh, it's a biochemistry model, I think, on very, very detailed. So I've actually picked a different abstract from, from a study that I just showed you the title. So ocean CO2 uptake. And we're, gonna, we're going to walk through the advice that's given in this, uh, this online example on how to write a nature abstract. That doesn't mean that we should write nature papers all the time. On the contrary, it's just that the way nature, typical nature papers organize their abstracts are just very neat, very logical, and it's a really good way to, uh, to, to write a clear abstract. So let's start with the way this is done. So on the left-hand side, you have a number of, uh, of pointers that explain how one phrase should go should flow to the next to build up a logical and clear abstract. And it all starts with a basic introduction to the, to the field. So the first phrase of, of this particular abstract, ocean CO2 uptake accounts for 20 to 40 percent of the post-industrial sink for anthropogenic CO2. Okay, so that's a broad audience opening telling you about the importance of, uh, of ocean atmosphere CO, CO2 exchange. And typically, the second phrase goes into the detailed background on the particular topic, and it explains the current paradigm. So in this abstract, it goes, the uptake rate is the product of the CO2 interfacial concentration gradient and its transfer velocity, which is controlled by spatial and temporal variability in near-surface turbulence. Okay, so you, you get the feeling, right? There's, a, there's much more detail in here on the context uh, and on, on the current paradigm. The third phrase states the problem or inconsistency in current research. This variability complicates CO2 flux estimates and in large part reflects a variable sea surface microlayer enrichment in biologically derived surfactants that cause turbulent suppression. Okay, so something is complicated something we don't really understand today on this particular topic. So then you move on by stating what you have investigated. Here we present a direct estimate of this surfactant effect on CO2 exchange at the ocean basin scale with derived relationships between its transfer velocity determined experimentally and total surfactant activity for Atlantic Ocean surface seawaters. Then you state what you have, uh, <coughs> state what you have found. And I indicate, here, you can make a choice here. You either write in the present tense or in the past tense. These authors are writing in the past tense. So we found, instead of we find, they write, we found up to 32% reduction in CO2 exchange relative to surfactant-free water. Applying a relationship between sea surface temperature and total surfactant activity to our results gives monthly estimates of spatially resolved surfactant suppression of CO2 exchange. Large areas of reduced CO2 uptake resulted, notably around 20 degrees north, and the magnitude of the Atlantic Ocean CO2 sink for 2014 was decreased by 9%. Uh, so a clear statement, two or three phrases on what they found in detail. And then it all ends with the implications for this particular and for related research fields. So this direct quantification of the surfactant effect on CO2 uptake at the ocean basin scale offers a framework for further refining estimates of air sea gas exchange up to the global scale. Gas exchange in general, other gases than CO2. Um, well, I suppose you immediately also see that an abstract is actually it's a short version of, a, of an entire paper. Uh, 
which is the main reason that we're going to focus on this. Um, so what else do we recognize? These, the authors on this paper, if I remember well, are a British team, so they are native English speakers. Uh, so what you find is that some of the phrases are actually fairly long. They are longer than the, than the two lines that I would like to see. Uh, so we can do a little bit of text analysis and see if we can still improve or clarify or simplify this abstract. Uh, so focusing on phrase length, there are two particular phrases that are very long. Uh, this first phrase in red, that, and then the second one in red also, and we can imagine splitting these up in uh, in two different phrases. Example of the first one, the uptake rate is the product of the CO2 interfacial concentration gradient and its transfer velocity, period. This velocity, repeating words, is controlled by spatial and temporal variability in near surface turbulence. Okay, so same thing for the, for the second phrase. It's actually yeah, three lines long. Just split it up. Second one, are there any pronouns left in this abstract? Turns out there are. So I indicated those in, uh, in green. There's one of them. It's, not, it's hard to see. There's one of them in the, at the end of the first red line. Okay, It's transfer velocity. And same thing. It's transfer velocity a little bit later in, in the blue phrase. So what, what does it's transfer velocity, what does that refer to? Is that does it refer to the uptake rate, to the CO2 interfacial concentration gradient, to the experimental relationship, etc.? So, I personally refer to re prefer to replace all of these pronouns by the terms they refer to. Okay, so in this case, it refers to the CO2 transfer velocity. So there is no doubt about what you're trying to say. So when you, when you do a text analysis, you're, you're basically your own writing, just go through it, mark all of them, and then start replacing them by the words that you are referring to. Very simple exercise. Um, so that's it for the abstract. So on the, on the back side of your printout, you can find this abstract, so you can work with the, uh, with the sections on the left and try to organize later on today your own abstract with this kind of logic that I just explained. Okay, so let's move on and, and talk a little bit more about uh, the, the other classical sections of a science paper. The introduction. Its function is quite literally uh, answering the question, what was I studying? Why was that an important question? And what did we know about it before I did this study? And how will my study advance our knowledge on this? So there is a there's a pretty simple idea to apply to, to an introduction. It's called the inverted triangle, where the broadest part, where you start writing, it represents the, the most general information for non-specialists. And as you go further down into your introduction, you, you get into the context and into the details of the field, and you focus on the specific problem that you studied. Um, at the start of the introduction, clearly identify the broad subject of interest. And you do this, by again, by repeating uh, keywords from your title in the first sentences of the introduction. So you explain the context by summarizing what we already knew about a specific problem before you did your study, basically what's been done before. You cite the literature. Uh, if you find it difficult to, you know, to line that up in the sense of telling a story, just start by citing each important paper, paper. You summarize it in one or two lines in chronological order of appearance, of appearance. And then you try to make a logical story out of that. Then sort of halfway in the introduction, clearly state the purpose or the hypothesis that you are investigating. Pretty basic wording. The purpose of this study was to do this and this and that, or we investigated three uh, possible mechanisms or three different hypotheses on this and this and that. Finally, you end with sort of a clear statement of the approach to the problem you, you studied. So we measured 
X number of rock samples from this area, and we analyze this and this and that, period. Materials and methods. I won't go in detail here. I'll just say two things. It's really important to provide enough detail so that other people can repeat your study. If you don't do that, you're not really contributing to, to the advancement of science, I think. Then again, don't make materials and methods unnecessarily long. You don't have to blab on and on and on about the field location, about the details of the method. Keep it, keep it condensed, but provide all the essential information so that people can repeat it. For the results and discussion section, you actually have two choices here. You can split them up, a separate results and a separate discussion section. Um, or you can combine them. If you, if you separate it, which, and this is really a matter of taste, uh, you very dryly present your results to the point without interpretation in an orderly and logical sequence. Often it's simple results first, ending up with more complex results. Then in your discussion, you, you come back to your findings, to those results in light of what was already known. So the discussion is often then developed with, by repeating what you, what you cited in, in the introduction about previous studies. And then you compare what you find, et cetera. You develop your discussion. Uh, explain your new understanding of the problem after taking your results into consideration and end by discussing the broader implication. Second option is to combine it, right? Results and discussion. This is something that I personally prefer. But I acknowledge it's maybe not the easiest thing to do. I like that because this is what helps you telling a story. You present a little bit of results, you discuss it, and then you often, at the end of that paragraph, you end up with, uh, with a question or with a, a, a clear something to do that you are going to address in the next paragraph by presenting a little bit more results, discussing them, etc. So you are going to build up uh, the story of basically what you've found, what it means, and what the implications are. In the end, it's similar, but it's a different way of, of uh, discussing your results. And really, this is a matter of taste. There are many scientists who prefer separating these, and some of us prefer uh, combining them. Uh, conclusions or implications. Again, this depends a little bit on the journal type. There are journals that ask you for a conclusion section, there are now journals that forbid you to have a conclusions section. They just want sort of a final discussion paragraph where you discuss implications. If you do sort of classical conclusions, uh, often it, it looks very similar to your abstract. It's just a summary of the main points, so I would recommend you to keep it short. I do actually like this sort of, this, not this boring conclusion lineup, but this implication section because uh, it gives you the liberty to, to use a little bit of your imagination explaining why this is important for other fields, for, for things that can be done uh, next. So it's a little bit closer to, um, to implications and perspectives, something that you will run into in, uh, when you write your PhD dissertation. There's, there are conclusions, but also perspectives. Um, so an implication section uh, means describing the broader implications of your findings. And actually some examples, in, if we go back to this abstract and this particular study on uh, on surface seawater biological surfactants, we can ask ourselves, well, what could be, let's fantasize, what could be the broader implications of that particular study? What could you talk about in, in that section? Um, so some of the things that came to mind is, well, maybe sea spray formation, aerosol formation, is also affected by, uh, by these surfactants. It changes the surface tension on, on small droplets so maybe aerosol formation is different, and that would be important for, uh, for climate modeling. What about the albedo effect, sunlight reflection? We all know that when surfactants are uh, clearly present in solution, you sort of get this oily film with all these different colors. So maybe that affects uh, sunlight as well. So you can imagine in an implication section 
describing and talking about all these different potential um, uh, important implications, right? Okay, so last slide with some final thoughts. When you, I think when you read papers, actually pay attention to how other people write, right? I, when I opened uh, this presentation, I said, well, you know, uh, you can run into badly written papers, stuff you don't understand. So look at that, but also pay attention to the papers you really like, that, you, that are easy to follow. You know, ask yourself, why are they so easy to follow? What is it that the authors do that makes that science so accessible? Okay? Um, so we all have, a, we have PDF libraries, right, ordered by different fields, climate change, contaminants, microplastics, you name it. Make some, make some sections where you have good papers, bad papers. Sort them out and especially good papers. Come back to those and remind yourself why, why they were so well written. Um, so I, there's many websites on this kind of topic. If you Google scientific writing English, you will find many of them. You know, I just line up a few examples that I looked at. Finally, when you write a draft of your paper, it, it's not always that so easy to, you know, to have all these rules or these suggestions in your head and start writing. It doesn't work like that. Uh, one thing that, that often people recommend is that when you start writing, just get it out of your brain, put it on paper. Don't think about the rules or the suggestions. Just get your thoughts on paper, perhaps in simple phrases. But why not in long phrases? So get it on paper, and then the next thing you do, that, that's where you, you step back, you take this set of suggestions, and you start doing a text analysis on your own text. So check if your phrases are short. Look up all the pronouns. Uh, remove them. Replace them. Connect phrases. Connect paragraphs. Okay? Refine your storyline. But often, just first get it out of your head. Get it on paper. Uh, finally, if you feel you're stuck, work with your advisor, work with people in your equipe, in your team. Okay? Have other people read your text. And when they give you feedback, uh, don't, don't hit that button in Word. Accept all corrections, because you will learn absolutely nothing. Uh, go through them one by one. And if you don't understand or disagree, go to the person uh, that, that made the corrections and ask them why. Uh, it's also, I try to keep that in mind myself. Sometimes when, as an advisor, I make corrections too fast, I don't explain why I make a correction. It's also not good. So I keep reminding myself to, to add a little comment why I make a certain correction. Uh, finally, remember, you do not have to agree with corrections. Okay? Corrections are suggestions. That's it. So it's open to questions. And a question. If you can present yourself very shortly, including the labs. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I'm from Ecolab. I'm a PhD student in the third year. Uh, what about uh, the using of we, all results, and, uh, and everything, and stuff like that in the paper? So yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's very common to, to write we. Uh, it's more rare to write I. You would have to write a single author paper. It's not so common anymore. But the we form is, is just fine. Uh, it, it's a matter of taste. You know, either you don't use it or you use it all the time. Hi, uh, I come from Lagos and PhD student in second year. And I have a question about uh, discussion and conclusion section because sometime in the paper they are gathering together. So what's your opinion? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fine with that. It, it's what I said. Some journals um, do not allow you to have a conclusion section. Environmental science and technology is one of them. If you write a conclusion, a header conclusion, and then your boring little list of conclusions, the editor will tell you to remove that. Uh, so in that case, you, you, we, we get to your example where a discussion ends with a single paragraph that we do not call conclusions. 
but that still kind of conclude, but generally you write about implications. So it's not the boring list of conclusions where you repeat kind of what you just discussed and what's already present in the abstract, but where you focus on the implications of your conclusions. So it's a little bit different way of, of doing that, but it's perfectly fine not to have a conclusion section. Hi, my name is Sylvain. I'm a PhD student uh, at GET in first year. Uh, what about passive voice? Because sometimes, uh, um, yeah, uh, professor would say not to use it, but it's also very convenient sometimes. So, um, do you have an example? <laughs> not at hand, but uh, I know I tend to use it a lot, but. Uh, when I read, I would prefer uh, active voice, would you say? I mean, when it's uh, not used. Yeah. So, so I don't know. Yeah. Like, I you I know, th these things has been done uh, this, w this way, something like this. Yeah, maybe Nick has, a, has an example or a, an answer to that. I think it's connected with the previous question about whether it's okay to say we. Um, passive voice is some kind of aversion to using personal pronouns when you're writing. And uh, it, it's, it's a bit of an artificial rule, in my opinion. Um, many people use personal pronouns when they write. Um, as Eowyn said, it's not often that you say I, but even when I write a single author paper, I, I sometimes say we, because I include the reader in the experience, right? So if you're using passive voice just to avoid a personal pronoun, then think again, right? Um, but I wouldn't say thou shalt not use the passive voice. If it's convenient and if it's clearer, then use it. Right? Yeah, so it's a matter of taste and you can, you can experiment with it. You can make a mix of both. <coughs> Another question? Good morning. I'm Pauline Mejean, engineer from the JET Laboratory. Um, do you think that the abstract is the last part to write? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, most advisors recommend that to students, you write the abstract in the end, so you first develop your paper, and once you're done with it, once your discussion is, is clear, your science interpretations are clear, then you all summarize it in your, in your abstract. Uh, personally, the first thing I do is write the abstract. But I... I don't know because whether that is because of my experience. I've been writing for, for 20 years. And to me, when I write a paper, it's kind of, you know, it's jumbled up in my head. And when I get it out, I first write the abstract because then I have a clear outline for my paper. And then when I develop the paper, I just stick with the abstract. And it also means that to me, the whole outline of a paper is it, clear from the start. And I think for you, the students, that's, that's not always the case. Nick has a comment on that. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is great because you've got an example of the two lecturers have completely opposite uh, approaches to, to this. Um, I always write the abstract last because I think that writing a paper is actually part of doing the research and I never know for sure what's going to be in the paper until I've finished writing it. Sometimes I have to go back to the to the science and do some other stuff because I realize while I'm writing that I didn't understand what I was doing, right? So for me, um, I don't have the confidence that everyone has that uh, I've done the research, now I'll write the paper. I, I, I think of writing the paper as part of the research process, so I write the abstract at the end. <laughs>